Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Martell. I'm really proud to represent the board of Pride in our workplace. Um, and we are a nonprofit dedicated to ensuring that the LGBTQ plus professionals uh, in the professional world have a platform to amplify their voices, have a way of coming together as a community, um, and to share resources and our collective experiences. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'd like to wish a very happy Lesbian Visibility Day or week to all of my sapphic sisters. Good to see you. Um, happy as always to have representation. Uh, I'm really proud to be part of PIOW. Uh, and if you don't know about this organization, after today, you, you, you absolutely should be following us um, because this is a group of volunteers from the business community um, who believe that a thriving and equitable workplace experience is not only possible for our community, but well within reach. Um, and we're so happy to have uh, the opportunity to hold space for conversations like this one today about the future of work. And we have a number of programs throughout the year focused on this topic. Um, before I introduce myself, uh, my panelists and our topic, I wanna invite you to follow PIOW if you go to the next slide, um, because we've got coverage on every social channel, as well as our newsletter, to make sure that you don't miss any uh, update. Curated resource about what's happening in the world of LGBTQ plus in business. Um, and one such exciting update that I'd love to share with you today um, is actually a brand new grant program that we have in place. There's a deadline of applying to this grant program at the end of next month, May 31st. And I encourage you to share it with any small LGBTQ plus facing nonprofit who's serving the community um, here in Massachusetts or New England. Basically, what this grant program does is recognize um, and give grantees seed money. That's right, people, cash money, plus skill and operational development, which is super important to scaling and growing those nonprofit efforts, plus visibility and the support of the PIOW broader business community. So send that link down there, piow.org slash grants to anyone who you think could benefit from this program. We're actively accepting donations uh, or grantee applications. And the deadline again is May 31st. Go to the next slide, please, because our grant program, today's event, all of it is made possible from the sponsors, these allied businesses who make PIOW, which is a volunteer-led organization, possible. So thank you as well to our sponsors. Um, and PIOW gives value back to these sponsors um, who look to us for support in navigating their own workplace experiences. So by being a sponsor, you can tell they're actively invested in kind of the same mission as us and everyone on this call today of better and more equitable future of work. That's what today's conversation is all about. Uh, we're going to be talking about what systemic barriers face the youngest adults who are entering the workforce from the LGBTQ plus community. We're talking folks that are like 18 to 25, just beginning their careers. Um, and so I'll start with a couple of stats. We'll get introductions to our incredible panelists today, but then we're going to get into a panel discussion. I know it's going to generate some questions for you, my esteemed audience. So use that Q&A tab or the chat to um, let us know what questions you have or what you think. We love to hear from you. This is an interactive conversation. Hopefully let us know what is going on on your mind, Q&A or chat. All right, my friends, let's set some context to what we're up to today. We're talking, like I said, about those entering the workplaces for the very first time, 18 through 25. I think that it's well known, but let me just put a finer point on it, that LGBTQ plus youth face disproportionately high rates of unemployment. The pandemic exacerbated the situation, a Rutgers study, as if we need more of them, found that this community experienced higher rates of job loss, especially those 18 to 25. Job loss has incredible and dramatic effects on the overall well being of these individuals. Uh, to quote the Rutgers study, the intersection between financial stability, a standard of living, and health is all an integral balance. What's more, we are living in an ongoing climate of legislation that is targeting this future generation of LGBTQ plus professionals. 2020, of course, had a landmark Supreme Court ruling um, that affirmed that this community have the right to be free from discrimination in the workplace. But here in 2022, we've seen record numbers of legislation in different states, Florida, Ohio, Missouri, Tennessee, Louisiana, Alabama, all introducing or passing parental right legislation that bars even the discussion of LGBTQ plus topics in schools. We also have the Florida Stop Woke Act. We have more than 200 anti-LGBTQ plus bills, many anti-trans specifically introduced this year. These bills, of course, include restrictions on transition care, bathroom bills, ban on sports participation, 
it allows for a lot of behavior that is, is really negative and of course has dramatic impact on the youth and of course as business professionals, our future colleagues and our future leaders. So today's topic in this era and amid this climate I, is more important than ever. And I wanna thank my panelists for joining us today to help us understand how we as organizations, how we as individuals can create a better future even despite the challenges we're experiencing today. Our goal of course, and we believe that leaders and young people can not only survive, but thrive in the workplace and that what happens in a workplace has residual effects in the community. So I'm going to stop talking because my panelists today could not be more uh, relevant for this conversation. I'd like to welcome my panelists, Connor, Derek, Grace. Um, I'm going to start with you, Connor. Introduce yourself, my friend, please, and tell us about the organization that you're representing today. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I was really uh, excited to see how many people signed up. Uh, coming into this. And I was like, okay, about like 10% of those people are going to show, but basically half of you did, which is amazing. Um, so, so great to see so many familiar names and faces on the call today. Um, and as Katie uh, so wonderfully said, my name is Connor Schoen. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Break Time. I'm actually in the Break Time office space here today. We're based right by <clears throat> North Station, for those of you who are in Boston. And our goal is to break the cycle of young adult homelessness. Um, so when I was actually in my own process of coming out uh, as pansexual about five years ago, I was working at a youth shelter called Y to Y, which is based in Cambridge, Mass. Um, and that shelter specifically works with 18 to 24 year olds who are experiencing homelessness. And many of these young people, actually 40% of these young people are homeless because uh, of their gender or sex, gender identity or sexuality. So as I was sort of discovering myself at the age of 19, trying to figure out what all these different attractions I was having meant and uh, how to figure it all out, I was working at the shelter with such wonderful young people who, despite everything they were going through, were so brave and authentic about who they were. So for me, the experience of getting to work with LGBTQ plus young people experiencing housing insecurity has been something that has totally changed my life and my ability to be proudly part of the LGBTQ plus community. And so I think it's really the responsibility of our community as a whole to ensure that we're doing what we can to make sure that every single young queer person has uh, access to the types of opportunities and support that they need to reach their full potential. Um, so that's all what we're all about here at Break Time. We provide three months of transitional employment to young people experiencing homelessness, um, specifically providing them job opportunities at local nonprofits and small businesses, and then helping them to transition into the careers of their dreams. Um, and so we've been doing this work for about four and a half years. We're a relatively young organization. Um, and we're really excited to say that we're currently in the process of expanding statewide. So many of you are, I know, outside of Massachusetts, but for at least those of you in Mass, we hope that any young person throughout the Commonwealth can get access to our services. And one day, for those of you who are out West in Utah and other places I saw uh, when folks were coming in, or even maybe in London, hopefully one day we'll, we'll be there as well or be supporting organizations uh, that are doing great work there. So that's me and really excited to be having this event today. Uh, on behalf of the young people I work with, I think it's really uh, amazing that y'all are here to listen to this conversation and hopefully after this event really engage with each of our organizations and the work that we do. So thank you so much. I'll pass it back to you, Katie. Yes, thank you for being here, Connor. We talk about bravery and authenticity. You're doing it every day in the work you do. Thank you on behalf of that cohort that you serve and for representing their perspective today. Um, and I'll pass it over to another leader working, again, all of you are working to help this population, but Derek Young Jr. from uh, Leadership Brainery, welcome to the broadcast and thank you for being here. Please tell us about the organization you're representing. Awesome, yes, thank you so much, Katie. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for everybody at Pride in our workplace. Um, I really appreciate the work you all are doing uh, for having pride in our experiences, for, for amplifying our voices. Um, we need more organizations like you all, and I'm just glad that we have you here um, in Boston. And of course, thank you everyone for attending. Um, so I'm Derek Young. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Leadership Brainery. Uh, and Leadership Brainery, I also saw a couple of my board members uh, in the chat too. So hey, thanks for being here. Um, Leadership Brainer is an organization that's focused on increasing access to master's and doctoral degrees for underrepresented communities. 
Um, and when we say underrepresented communities, we define that as um, people who identify as um, people of color, LGBTQ, low income, uh, and also first generation um, students, um, first generation college graduates. Um, many of you who uh, may not know that jobs that require master's degrees or higher are one of the fastest growing segments um, at entry level. And we find it a necessity to ensure um, that communities who have been barred for education um, and workforce leadership opportunities for decades because of their identity, because of what they look like, because of who they love, um, it's essential for us to make sure that they have the tools and resources um, to get to the highest levels of education. Um, there's so many important organizations that we do work with that do a lot of development from K through 12 in college access, and we're taking it to the next level all the way up to master's and doctoral degrees. Um, many folks look at them as a luxury, but they are not a luxury, they're a necessity. There are many careers in our in society that absolutely require postgraduate education, like being a lawyer, being a doctor, being a professor. You can't access any of those industries without advanced degrees, and we need to make sure that LGBTQ folks have more um, influence at our leadership tables, and that's why we do the work that we do. 21% um, of all of our program participants identify as LGBTQ, so we're really proud of that um, and feel like our resources that we're providing are helping them um, find mentors who have similar experiences, um, find the resources that they really need to um, be empowered and confident in their experience going to post-grad. Um, but like you said earlier too, Katie, making sure that they not only survive through those experiences of going to post-grad and getting workforce leadership opportunities, but they thrive um, all the way through. Uh, and so we're, we're really proud of the work we're doing, hoping that more people continue to go on board. Um, similar to Break Time, we are a relatively um, new organization, been around for four years um, and may actually be turned four. So we're really excited about that. Um, based in the Back Bay um, area. And I'm not originally from Boston, neither me or my co-founder. Um, I'm born in Chicago, raised in Kansas City, Missouri, and I came to Boston for graduate school um, here at Tufts School of Medicine for my, my master's in public health. And um, at that experience, I was the only Black man coming to my program that year in 2015. Um, I then went off to Boston University School of Law um, and stayed there for a second before I self-eliminated myself from that process. But I was one out of two Black men to enter into my law class in 2017. So it was through those experiences, um, and of course, not only being a black man, but being a same-sex loving man um, as, as well, through those experiences that we had to step up and say, we just can't go through these institutions and leave and let folks have these same experiences. We have to do something about it um, because when we look at our workforce, when we look at all these laws that's being passed to ostracize and oppress us, we need more leaders at the tables and for us, our experience to leadership roles was through advanced education, and we want to ensure that more folks can have those opportunities. So thank you so much for having me. I look forward to having a conversation today. Remarkable. We're so happy. And I mean, housing, education, right? These are all pipelines yeah. that affect the workforce. So we're so happy to have this uh, diverse perspectives. Um, and Derek, happy 10 year anniversary, speaking of your same sex love. We're so excited for you uh, and Jonathan. So happy to have you both. And finally, but last, certainly not least, Grace Sterling Stowell, thank you so much for being here. Tell us all about yourself and Bagley. <laughs> thank you so much, Katie. I'm really honored to be here today. Thank you, Connor and Derek. Happy to share the panel with you. And thank you to everybody who, who has come out to listen to us and participate in this conversation. Uh, so my name is Grace Sterling Stowell. I use she and they pronouns. I'm the executive director of Bagley, the Boston Alliance of LGBTQ youth. Uh, Bagley was founded in 1980. So we're 42 years old uh, this year. And uh, we are now the oldest and largest LGBT youth organization in Massachusetts and really one of the longest standing in the nation. Um, and we've grown up, come a long way from those early days. I, if, if you hear me talking about the history and I say we, I, I was there speaking of young leadership. So I was a young leader 42 years ago um, uh, and earlier. And, and so when Bagley was just being founded uh, by young people, uh, I dropped in as well and worked with the founders to help this new organization get established and grow. And so uh, we, we've come a long way from an all volunteer social support group to now an established 
nonprofit uh, providing youth leadership development programming, health promotion programming, and community organizing and advocacy work uh, led by and for uh, young people. Uh, that the mission of Bagley and and the the central focus of Bagley is youth leadership and and has always been and continues to be uh, developing youth leaders. So not only are they able to to get the support that they need, but they're able to advocate for their peers uh, moving forward and to and to help the world <laughs> move and have the world move forward in a better way. And I always feel like you know I talk a lot about intergenerational leadership, and it's so important that young people and adults and elders are working together uh, to 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 make sure that we all have a better world than than the one the one we have now. <laughs> um, so uh, Bagley uh, is also we're, we're based in Boston, but we're a statewide organization. We manage what is called the Agley Network, which is a network of 15 community-based uh, organizations using Bagley's model across Massachusetts. And Bagley provides funding and, and technical assistance, training, and support uh, to, to support the youth leaders and adult leaders across the state uh, doing similar work. Um, some of our newest programming is focused focusing on the direct needs of young people. The pandemic really especially highlighted the need that young people are experiencing uh, food insecurity, housing insecurity, uh, obviously employment need, needing income and uh, especially um, young people who are experiencing a whole range of issues as well. Uh, we know that uh, mental health issues are important and the pandemic has exacerbated that really for all of us, but but the, the, the research is showing, the statistics are showing that young people in particular are, are facing increased mental health and behavioral health challenges. So because of that, Bagley has responded both currently and in the last few years to directly try to support those. And two of the, the biggest things that we've been doing, we've established a new host homes program that provides short-term transitional housing for young adults, 18 to 25, uh, to help them get on their feet, find a job, you know, focus on schooling, whatever they need to do, as well as the support services to, to help them in doing that. Um, and we also have behavioral health programming that we, we had before the pandemic, but are now actively seeking to expand so that young people will get the, the support that they need. So uh, we've come a long way um, and uh, the community's come a long way. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to join you all today and participate in this conversation in any way that would be useful. Thank you. Grace, we're so grateful for the work you've done and do at Bagley. I know for I can speak for many when I say that, you know, many young people in my life have directly, their lives have been transformed from the resources available at Bagley at a time when they really needed it. And you've mentioned some of the acute needs that the organization is addressing now. Obviously, the pandemic has exacerbated quite a few of them. But in general, each of our panelists, even just by the nature of their organization, have highlighted some of the systemic barriers that youth face. We talk about thriving in life, but particularly, I'd like to focus us now on what barriers they, they face. We've mentioned a few of them, mental health, you know, homelessness, right? around the entering of the workforce and the kind of culture in the workplace that would allow them to thrive. I want to get specific, and I'd like each of you to share what you think to be are the top challenges that this particular community faces as they try to enter the workforce, maintain that employment, and, access, and excel and um, proceed up the ladder you know, to become leaders in the organizations. Um, and Connor, I'm going to put you on the spot again and start with you. If you. I hope you don't mind. It's that flag behind you that's giving me strength here. But what are you seeing as it relates to these barriers? Specifically, again, we're talking about youth, 18 to 25, our next generation of leaders in the workplace. Yeah, well, I'll open by saying that we just the other day at break time saw some new data come out specific to Massachusetts, but it translates across the country and across the world, which is that prior to the pandemic, the number of young people who were disconnected from work and school, meaning they're neither in school and not working, was approximately 57,000 here in Mass. Now it's 88,000, which is a four percentage point increase. That's 10% of young people. Uh, and that's, that survey was between 16 and 24 here in Massachusetts. So we're seeing live in the data that we're collecting beyond just anecdotally working with young people every day here at break time, the ways in which the pandemic has in some ways opened up opportunities for many in the workforce to transition, to get promoted. But for those who are entering the workforce, particularly those with barriers to employment, it has created a completely separate employment crisis. And to Katie's question around why this is, what are these barriers that are 
not allowing young people to get into all these job openings, all these opportunities out there. The biggest ones I want to highlight are really um, support and stability. So the young people that I work with, many of them are have no sort of familial support. And a lot of them have been kicked out of their homes just because of the way they identify, which unfortunately, many of us either personally or with people in our lives have had that experience. And if you have no savings, if you have no other people to go to, your options are incredibly limited. And if you seek shelter, almost all shelters are gender binary, meaning that there's a male section and there's a female section. Um, and regardless of where you exist on the gender spectrum, uh, and regardless of your sexuality, those are already dangerous places for young people um, because there's a lot of instances of sexual violence and assault um, and harassment in those, in those places, just by a product um, of some of, the, uh, some of the challenges that the folks in those places are facing. So when it comes to shelter, young people, at least here in Boston, have like 60 youth specific shelter beds in total that they can, that they can choose from. So they're stuck trying to stay with um, someone in a situation that isn't safe, trying to stay on someone's couch, um, trying to go out and find a place on the street. And they're totally stuck without any sort of support. So that piece around support is key. And in terms of stability, there's no housing stability for these individuals. They have no sense of consistency. So when it comes to work, all of these external factors make it exponentially more challenging to succeed on the job. So what these young people need is they need supportive job opportunities that are helping them to maintain job security. So for example, what we do at break time is we essentially guarantee job security over the, the course of three months. You're on our payroll but we staff you out to work at local nonprofits and small businesses who are looking for talent. So they don't, those businesses aren't incurring the sort of um, risks and challenges of working with someone who's in to no fault of their own or really unstable situation, but we're supporting you. Uh, we're providing emergency funding. If there's any, if you need a hotel bed or if you need an Airbnb for two weeks while you're waiting on a shelter wait list, we're matching any savings you put aside, we're providing credit counseling, really building that foundation for job and financial security that translates into long-term housing security and overall success. And so, again, I really think that the two most vital things we see are those support and that stability piece, um, where support means providing that sense of of family and unconditional love to someone that doesn't exist when, an, when a queer young person has come out and been rejected by those that they trust in their life, or maybe never had family stability. They came through the foster care system. Um, they've lost their family members to uh, incarceration or to, to, to uh, death. Um, that's a piece that's lacking that we need to provide. And then on the stability side, really creating opportunities that create a stable pipeline for young people going into the workforce uh, by supporting their job security, investing in them. Um, because a lot of these young people as they're entering the workforce, they're not gonna get it right on day one. So we really need to buy into their long-term success just as we're telling them to do when investing in their long-term education and success. Um, so those are the two things that we see as most vital here at break time. Um, and we really think that these barriers are uh, you know, it is achievable to overcome these barriers and to ensure that 88,000 young people here in Massachusetts do not have to be disconnected from work in school, but we have to put the financial resources and our own hearts and hands behind making the support and the stability possible for these young people to transition into the workforce. Right. And thank you for emphasizing both the, uh, the scope of this. I mean, from 57,000 up to 88 is unbelievable. Um, and we're so grateful that you're here. Hopefully some orgs on the, on the call, uh, recognize that they can partner with the organization and we'll, you know, we sent some, uh, links in the chat about how you can get in touch with Connor and his team at break time. Um, but what an acute problem and grace, I'm sure that you see some similar themes in your work, uh, with young people as for what prevents them from having the support, this type of stability that then leads to a supportive career. Yeah, absolutely. Everything that Connor said, absolutely. The, the 
the the foundational needs is, is we think of employment. We think of a lot of these issues as separate, but they're not. And and for any of us to be gainfully employed and to hold a job and to succeed and to advance, we need a stable living situations, safe living situations. We need food, clothing. We we need we need the clothing to show up at work and 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 participate. Uh, depending, especially depending on what the job is. So we we need the basic things. And young people, if young people don't have them or they come from families that themselves are, are fractured or struggling, then, then young people aren't provided with that. And often disproportionately LGBTQ young people often don't have that. And so they're starting, they're starting from scratch, especially if they didn't have educational opportunities or the, the other things that would even provide the training for, for what does it mean to be employed? What does it mean to show up every day at nine if that's the requirement of your job? What does it mean uh, to interact with folks and, and to have a supervisor and to be part of a team? You know, These aren't things that none of us are born knowing those things. And if we aren't growing up in a family environment that supports and provides that or an educational environment or a living situation, and that does, then, then young people are more at risk. I think another important point too is just an acknowledgement, and I think this is a good thing, of how much the community has changed over the years because of my how long I've been doing this work. I look back at over a long view and, and be, you know, in the old days, it was, it was really a minimum, a very, very low standard. We wanted to either get hired and not get fired. And, and so, you know, thankfully, that young people know that they deserve more than that. And it's not just about getting a job or, or, or not losing the job, but it's actually about succeeding. And for work, workforces and workplaces to see uh, LGBTQ young people as assets and not, not, some, not just tolerance, not just acceptance, but actually, oh, this, this will strengthen the workplace. You know, LGBTQ young people, yet like young people of other identities and experience are going to enrich the, 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 work, the workplace and what we do. And that is so important uh, for the young person to feel that way. So it's important for adults to know that. Uh, we all wanna know that we have something to contribute. And I think really the important work is looking at, so do, do, do the workplaces, are they, are they not just welcoming, but are they the kind of place that that is situated in the community in such a way that they that that LGBTQ young people would even see that company as a place they would want to work? And and so we we don't know that we we often hear the bad stories. So if 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 uh, in the workplace there there it's a company that is proactive, that is progressive, that is situated in the community around LGBTQ and other progressive issues, then. Then, and then that needs to be very clear, not just in policies, but in action. And so, um, you know, we often find that young people who are well prepared to be successful in the workplace, and they, they, but if they leave the bubble of, say, Bagley or other queer and community and trans community organizations, and they start at a workplace, and suddenly they're like, oh, they're not. They're not understanding my pronouns. They're not experiencing my, my identity. They, I sh I'm not supposed to talk about certain things, or you know, or they just haven't done the work. And so they they're they're perfectly poised to succeed in terms of their skills and what they have to bring. But they're not if they have to overcome additional barriers and start educating their their coworkers or their boss or their or their supervisor or the company itself about who they are and what they need. So I think there's mm -hmm. there's sort of the the, the immediate level and then and there's a big picture level of how we can make sure that all of our workplaces are really set up to best support the success of young people. One thing you said is resonating both with me and folks in the chat that sometimes one of the biggest aspects of, and Connor, this is also in relation to what you um, shared, the, one of the biggest barriers for these young people is acknowledging the barriers are real. Alexander, thank you for pointing that out. She writes, a not insignificant number of people I work with deny the reality of these obstacles, which makes it harder to uh, you know, solve them. You can't solve a problem we don't see or understand clearly. So half the work is, is awareness. The other half, of course, is real action. Yes, not policies, but action. And Derek, I want to throw this to you to ask, what is that action? I mean, we've heard a lot about the hiring and recruitment crisis. You know, as Grace says, yes, young people are going to want to work for organizations that support them, that need to make it clear that the culture is supportive. Um, and the great resignation that's happening is causing a lot of folks to rethink the environment in which they work. What are you seeing in terms of this supportive environment? What does a workplace, or in your case, an institution of higher education, have to do to ensure that these barriers don't exist? That What does a workplace look like that is supportive for this cohort? Yeah, that's a great question. I was about to uh, 
uh, reemphasize on that support and stability for a moment, um, but I really do think um, this goes to all of that, and that's representation first. Like ensuring that we do have representation at all levels from management to leadership and ensuring that when folks come into your institution, your educational institution or your company that they see themselves represented or folks like them represented is so important. And I think sometimes we really undervalue um, the importance of it. Oftentimes when I'm looking at organizations or when I know folks who are um, on the employment search, they will um, just really be moved if they see leaders who are LGBTQ, openly um, LGBTQ. And I don't think companies quite realize when people are even doing their research to apply for jobs, how many folks are taking the time to say, hey, will I feel comfortable? Will I feel represented in this workplace? Um, and who is there that actually understands my experiences? Who is there that will um, speak up for me when I am misgendered, when um, we do have bias dress codes and so forth um, to know that I matter too. And just because we have um, what we deem as a more um, um, prominent folks um, that we matter even if a few of us are only open at this workplace. And so that representation is really key. And then also mentorship and sponsorship. Um, and so now I'm in, you know, I do have a little representation, but it's always tough when you have um, one LGBTQ leader, and now everyone who comes in is leaning on them for mentorship and sponsorship. Uh, so really ensuring that we have um, in um, our justice, um, Katanji Brown Jackson actually said a, a meaningful representation um, of folks from these backgrounds so that we are um, making change and they do have the, the um, power and influence inside the institutions to really uh, step up and uh, call for change. And oftentimes when we think about mentorship um, versus sponsorship, is folks who will speak up for me. You know, I've been in this role for three years, for four years, I know that I'm performing well, it's time for me to go to the next level. But oftentimes so many people are so afraid um, to speak up for us because they don't want to be associated um, with the gay guy, or they don't want folks to think that you know, I'm too close to them. And so that's why, again, going back to that representation, making sure we have folks who are comfortable and can throw all of these biases and stigmas out the door um, and really just support a hardworking individual who deserves to be um, at the next level um, in, in, with their employer. And so I would say those are the two things for me that I really feel like employers need to hone in when it comes to action, making sure that you have meaningful representation um, and also making sure that you're being intentional around having support systems around mentorship and sponsorship um, so that folks who already have their backs up against the wall um, are not struggling to speak up for themselves in a society that already tells us that we're not good enough. Right. And it's it's uh, not lost on me and folks in the chat that this is something that we can't help but live with every day. So it's not an option not to bring up these challenges. So your call for allies and your call for sponsorship, mentorship, but others just to speak up about a community which would they, from, of which they not, may not be a part is critical. I, Alexandra writes again. Thank you, Alexander Fred. You know, um, uh, I, I can't ignore the challenges. They're very real. It's amazing that colleagues can dismiss them even as they are describing them. And um, there's also Crow in the chat. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing track because the chat is on fire about somebody who's disabled, who has to live with that every day. But the burden falls upon members of any marginalized community to advocate for themselves. This is a matter of allyship. And this is why we're so happy to have folks from such a, a broad swath of businesses, um, because this is about advocating for those who have to advocate for themselves, but shouldn't have to, because this is a matter that needs to be addressed from all. Connor, I want to hear from you about um, this idea of allyship, but also what this means to you. If you had to tell workplaces what you wish they would understand about the youth that you serve, what do you wish more workplaces understood and then took action on? Yeah, I think for the young people I serve in particular, it's really about, um, it's about two things, patience and investment. Um, so on the patient side, um, for a lot of the young people I work with, they're not gonna get it right the first time. Um, we have a three week training program that you have to go to before you start your transitional job placement with break time. And during those three weeks, we have a lot of people who are late the first day, don't show up the first day. Um, 
but those are the people that we're meant to serve, right? So we see it in those first three weeks as people begin to improve. There was one man um, last week who was here with me every single day on the third week, but on the first week, he we didn't even know if he's gonna continue with the program. So that patience is really important um, to understand that young people with barriers to employment who haven't had the privilege and access to resources and support throughout their lives um, cannot just come in and hit a home run on day one all the time. Um, but that's not what we should expect out of them. And that's where we get the second piece, which is all about investment. And I mean investment in a lot of different ways. Investment in individuals' professional development, investment in support and in an individuals' well-being, and then investment, I think from a more structural side, in people's holistic success. Are you investing in uh, creating not savings opportunities for folks? Is that a 401k match or other things that help folks without intergenerational wealth to build their own nest egg to retire on? Are you supporting people in providing any sort of emergency savings funds or other things that people can tap into if they are in a hard situation? Um, these are things that we don't necessarily think about outside of the nonprofit world very often, um, but we should be. Um, so some of the things we do at break time is if someone comes on, they have up to $1,000 that we can give them to support emergency expenses that are holding them back, whether that's a late credit card bill, a cell phone bill, $1,000 to pay for a 14-day stay at an Airbnb, um, we provide credit counseling to all of our uh, staff and associates. We provide um, match savings uh, to all of our young people. So if they set aside a dollar, we're matching that dollar to dollar and they're leaving break time with over $1,000 in savings. But we also do that with our staff, with our 401k match plan. You can get uh, up to a $500 reimbursement on a gym membership to invest in your personal health. We really have to think innovatively about how is the person with the most barriers to employment, with the least wealth and privilege at your company, how are they going to succeed if they don't have the right resources behind them? If they have no parents supporting them, no money to fill the gap uh, throughout the first three weeks where they don't have pay and they're waiting for their first check, how are you supporting that person? Is it a sign-on bonus? Is it moving to a weekly payroll structure? We do weekly payroll for our staff and associates. These are the types of things that I think in the corporate world, we don't tend to think about as much because for a lot of people, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, they have enough cash to float on when they're transitioning to a new job. They have enough cash to help them through any emergency expenses. But if these resources aren't available, there's 40 million Americans who can't afford an, a random $400 expense. So you're saying 80 million Americans, you won't necessarily be able to stably work at your company and succeed if you don't have something in place to support them with that. So it's really about patience and investment. Um, and when we look at what's happening with the job market right now, we're all frustrated, we're all trying to hire. And I think the patience piece I'd really emphasize because um, we have to understand that if we're going to make big strides to opening up our hiring pool, reduce some of the requirements that create systemic barriers for LGBTQ plus and uh, people of color, then we're also going to have to have more patience because these people have systemically been deprived of the resources and privilege needed to, to come in and hit that home run on day one, so to speak. And the investment has to go alongside that. Otherwise, you're not helping them to advance from the situation they're in. So whatever ever flexibility and benefits that you can provide to folks, um, I'd also say, just again, trying to get really into the specifics here, providing health coverage, 100% contribution from day one, um, not having a 90-day probation period if possible. Um, those are the types of things that make the biggest difference for the people who are most often cut out from the workplace. Um, because typically the reason that a young person I work with can't get into some of these jobs is they, they sometimes can't afford that opportunity cost. They can't afford to go to college, not just because even if they had a full ride scholarship, they would be not saving any money. They would be having no money. They'd have no money to cover outside costs. 
So we really have to think about what investment means and how we're proactively investing people to make these opportunities more accessible so that they don't have to think about these short-term trade-offs and that they can work with you and focus on those long-term goals that they're going to achieve. And then they're going to be one of your higher performers at your company. So right. um, I hope that answers your original question. Oh, it so but, does. Yeah. And, it, and it does it in a, in a beautifully specific way. Thank you. And I'd like to actually pose a question to our audience. If if you're doing things at your organization um, that are this type of investment that Connor is describing, maybe it's different benefits you're offering, different programs, we would love to hear it. Please let us know in the chat what positive uh, actions your organization might be taking. Um, because I do think that Connor, this is such a beautiful, um, point. I mean, there's something that every organization on this call can do and it's adjusting benefits and it's nothing that they're not already, I guess I would imagine describe or discussing internally, the great resignation, this big employee, the conversation has shifted to how do we become the most attractive employer to not only attract this talent, but keep them. And the name of the game there is always about investing in your employees. I think what you're describing Connor is simply that this, no surprise, right? To anyone in a marginalized community, these issues are overlooked. Simply knowing how important weekly paychecks could be, how important that type of health coverage could be, just knowing access to mental health could be through, through coverage is transformative for people. I think simply knowing how transformative that is, is, is again, half the battle and a beautiful start. Thank you. Um, Grace, I would love to ask you, just kind of continuing on this point of what workplaces can do. Again, what do you wish more organizations hiring understood about what this population needs? Or what does the most, I guess, nirvana workplace look like to you to make sure that when they do get a job, again, it's an affirming one that they want to stay in? Well, I'm thinking of a couple of things, and you know, one one is sort of a reminder. You know, it's so important to acknowledge that, uh, except for our organizations represented here, and, and some others, of course, uh, you know, most most mainstream established corporate uh, you know entities and structures, uh, you know, throughout the country and in the world, you know, but it's certainly in this country were established um, for cisgender, heterosexual, white men, educated, land owning, you know, property owning, like it, like it was for not, not most of us. Right. And so we, people like us aren't, we're never set up to succeed or even participate in, in these settings. And so if we always remind ourselves that looking at the structures of how, how we do our work, Connor said so many great points around that is really looking internally around what are our policies, what are our practice, what do we do on the ground? Um, because because, because we unintentionally, it could just be like, oh, this is the way it's done, or oh, this is what we've always done, and, and we don't really know that it's actually causing harm, or that it's actually excluding, or that it's actually that it's it's in service of maybe the the majority, but not the but not the minority. Um, and then and another point I had too is just something simple is asking each employee. I mean, we really should do this right for every single employee. What do you need to succeed? What do you need to succeed here? Because we don't, you know, we can go through all the trainings and should and, and, and awareness and development and education and opportunities, but in the end, we, we don't know what each person, what each employee needs and what might fit, you know, LGBTQ is a whole lot of letters and, and they're all very different and, and have different experiences and histories and, and, uh, um, you know, representation. And so, uh, you know, especially if we're talking about a, a very significant difference between say cisgender, lesbian, gay, bi folks and, and trans and non-binary folks. Um, <clears throat> and so it, we, we need to make, remind ourselves that even no matter how much work we do, there's always more to learn. And the best way to start is asking your employee, what do you need to succeed? What can we do to help? We, you know, we, we can't do everything, but at least you're hearing and, and help and, and providing a space that says, this is a place where we want to know the answer to that question. And this is a place where we want to uh, support your success here. And that's just a different model that then so many you know, organizations were set up around competition and succeeding and the new employee is, oh my God, I have to do everything perfectly or I'll get fired or, or I won't get promoted. And it's just a different thing to say, oh, we want you here. We want you to succeed and what do you need? Just asking that question can go a long way. I also love that you've made this point. I just wanna highlight it that these systems what we all operate in every day, the systems of work, the system, right, are 
the way things are, we're not always uh, meant for people like us. And I love that point because it asks us to then reimagine systems and asks us to reimagine the structures that we've kind of taken for granted. That is not only challenging, but it's a beautiful opportunity to reimagine. And so in this space today, I thank each of you for bringing us new ways of reimagining. And the chat is also validating this. We've got um, Janelle, whose workplace provides coverage for almost all trans transgender transition related healthcare, as well as benefits such as surrogacy, IVF par par parentage. She said, they said it made a big difference for them and many other employees. And I can imagine it's about feeling welcomed. Uh, we also we hear a lot about DEI and B, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. The idea that do you belong in this workplace? What is a workplace in which you do feel like you belong and you aren't just another minority of the month, another extended of who the system is not built for. Um, so Derek, I'd like to toss this over to you. Anything resonating with you or anything to add again about the ideal workplace or what you wish more workplaces would know about the kinds of ways that they need to lower barriers through benefits, through culture, through all the things and mechanisms we're talking about today. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'll, I'll love to hone in on that culture piece um, a bit. I, I do think that companies have been very capitalistic in the way they highlight LGBTQ folks, um, especially during Pride Month. Um, and we need to make that a year round thing. Let's really ensure um, that we are not only showing cis straight couples year round, then when Pride Month comes around, that's when we wanna hi um, highlight all of our LGBTQ folks. Um, we deserve to be highlighted year round, just like everyone else. And I think that can really make a difference if people see that these companies are not just doing it um, because it's time to do it, but they're doing it because they really do care. Um, and it goes back to that representation, representation for me. Um, I know a leadership writer with a small team, um, but 80% of our staff does identify as LGBTQ. And we're really proud of that. Um, and we're, of course, both of our co-founders um, also identify as gay. And so that helps um, how we do our hiring. Um, but I'm hoping that really opens up perspective for many others to see um, how amazing job we're doing, how people do feel welcome, feel accepted when they come into our space and engage with our presence and know that they need more of that in their workplaces. Um, and that culture really does matter when you have that representation at, a, at, at the table. Um, it changes how we all interact with each other. It changes how we all accept each other, um, especially um, like you just mentioned, that, that belonging. And oftentimes we have been talking about DEI for a while and now we're introducing this belonging, but it's so important um, to know that uh, we need to hone in on that. I saw this image the other day that really stuck with me, um, but it said equity is the root and diversity is the blossom. Um, and if we don't focus on equity first, we won't get diversity. Um, and for so long we have been prioritizing diversity and saying, okay, well, we need to do diversity and equity. Um, but we really need to hone in on that equity comes first. What do our communities, our LGBT communities, our communities of color really need um, to thrive, to catch up from all this oppression that we've been experiencing for hundreds of hundreds of years um, so that we can be at a place where we um, are, I mean, I, I, I definitely would not say that we're underperforming by any measure. Uh, we definitely always overperform, um, but just, just so we do have the support system that other communities have is really essential. Right. And when you talk about equity, it's about ensuring folks have the same opportunity for success. And Connor and Grace, what you've described about the ways we could lift up people who don't have that equal same first step as many others, that's equity. That's a, a allowing for this equal access to opportunity. Um, I, I can't thank you enough, each of my panelists, for, again, addressing how the workplaces can, can take steps to, to make a more belonging culture, a more inclusive place. We're also operating, though, in this kind of... Um, it's a time people it's a deep it's a time for a deep breath because of what's happening around us but i would love to hear my panelists perspective on the legislative environment uh that's happening around us we, a business does not exist in a vacuum in fact a business is in my opinion part of the community and the fabric of the community around it it can't deny that you are employing people you are their source of health care and income you can't deny your role as a business. Um, I have a documentary in a book called Woke Washed, where we look at how companies pander to social movements because increasingly consumers and employees want their organizations to take a stand. Um, Derek, we're also hearing another acronym, DEIJ, right? Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice. So more brands than ever being looked at to take a stand on matters relating to social justice a lot of it starts internally with how they treat members of any minority internally. But I'd love to hear from each of you on what you're seeing with this um, horrendous legislative environment and the impact 
it then has on our future workforce. Um, Grace or Connor, do either of you want to kick <laughs> kick off that part of the discussion? Grace, I'd love to start with you, please. Sure. Um, you know, all, all we have to do is, uh, you know, look at Disney, what's happening with uh, Disney right now and say a company that was slow to speak up and to act didn't and then did and 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 but didn't do it in a way that was most helpful and and then and then was stronger and then the backlash came and you know it's never easy it's never easy into whether an individual or an organization especially one that has constituents and and consumers and so forth um but but it is important. It's vitally important uh, if, if we're really talking about walking the talk that that uh, LGBTQ and all you know folks who are experience uh, discrimination and oppression uh, for many different identities know that their company has their back, and that means often taking public and sometimes controversial stands and saying the right thing and doing the right thing, even when it is when it's not easy. Otherwise, it feels like oh, <laughs> you meant it, but only up to a point. So, um, so I think that's important. Where we're in a climate, uh, you know, I work with young people every day and, and we're in Massachusetts and it's a blue state and we have so much in so many ways. And yet one, one Massachusetts isn't perfect either. And we have our challenges and, and work to do. And two, th they see what's happening every day, especially, especially the, the just, you don't have to even look at social media or the news or anything to, to you can't miss the, the debates over whether trans girls should be playing in, in school sports or uh, whether get, we can even talk about LGBTQ issues in schools. And they're frightened. They're frightened that they could that happen here. And of course, it is happening here. You know, that's that's the thing. There, there, there are uh, you know, in towns across Massachusetts where folks are are showing up at local school committees and trying to push an agenda that is harmful to our communities. And so, I think it's really important that companies, businesses, organizations see themselves as situated in a community, in multiple communities, and that their their employees make up, not just their consumers, but their, their employees make up those communities, and to really think critically about what does it mean to be an ally, what does it mean to stand up, and <clears throat> and and I, I think that's that's something that um, you know, young people, young people uh, want it, but they're demanding it in a, in a newer and different way than ever before. Social media allows that so that they can actually hold folks accountable around. So what are you doing? You know, we didn't, we, we, we didn't see you speak up. We didn't see you address that issue, but you say, you say you are supportive of our community. So I think it's, it's a call to action and it's important for every organization if it hasn't already to be engaged in those conversations. Right. Connor, any thoughts there? Again, I just like to put you on the spot. Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, I agree with everything what Grace said, and I guess I'll focus on the, the side of how we can use advocacy to our advantage. Um, so this is something that is really important here at break time. Um, we have a whole policy team here and are really focused on dismantling systemic barriers that our young people face in the workforce um, and driving resources to support the work uh, that we are all doing to, to uh, address those challenges. Um, so actually currently today, we're in the midst of the uh, House budget debate in the Massachusetts House of Representatives uh, and Grace, Grace's organization Bagley and Break Time work together on um, a joint amendment to drive resources to support um, innovative job training and other wraparound supports for LGBTQ plus young adults experiencing housing and security across the state of Massachusetts. So, you know, we're taking steps to advance positive policy changes forward to sort of counter all of the negative things we see going on all across the country. And I think that's important because, um, you know, uh, policy change isn't only about blocking things and dismantling things from passing. We have to remember all the things that we wanna get through and the changes that we wanna make, the changes that have yet to come. And I would say that um, the, the budget process is a great way to do that, advocating on the local, state, and federal level for changes in the budget. Because I always say that the budget is the one thing the government has to pass every year. It's the one piece of policy that they must do to keep the government operating. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities within the budget. Every single line item has like a paragraph that goes alongside it. So there are a lot of opportunities to advocate for changes by changing the ways resources are directed, by ensuring that LGBTQ plus individuals are included 
in a specific workforce development line item, those sorts of things. So there's a lot of ways to get involved in advocacy. And I would say the power, particularly on the state and local level, the power of you calling or emailing your local representative on a particular issue to co-sponsor something, to vote in favor of something, it's actually pretty transformative because we as a society are really focused on federal issues for you know most of our bandwidth. And so state representatives and local um, officials, city councils, et cetera, tell me all the time that when they get a call from one of our young people or someone else, it's, you know, they're not getting a billion of those as would Senator Warren's office or, you know, another federal representative. So there are actual tangible ways that we just as citizens and as constituents locally can have an impact. And for those of us that don't have the uh, the restricted privilege of the voting box and getting to voting candidates, there are ways that we can join grassroots movements to advocate for these changes. For example, later today, there'll be a youth advocacy event at the state house um, to lobby senators on why it's so important that uh, more resources go towards youth employment. Um, and so, you know, regardless of where we are, where we live, what our citizenship status are, is there are lots of ways that we can proactively get involved in advocacy to ensure that we're advancing the things that we want to get moved through that are going to support LGBTQ plus access to the workforce. Derek, I think that segues nicely to your experience in higher ed. I mean, this idea of, of access and, and pipeline into the workforce, um, the lonely only, right? They call that experience of being the only one in the room. Um, and I'd love to hear your take on this because a lot of this advocacy work and a lot of this pipeline development that we're talking about really manifest itself in who you see in the classroom, who you see in the, in the cohorts that you described initially. What are your thoughts here? And, and talk to us again, not only how businesses can be allies, not only to LGBTQ plus youth, but taking an intersection sectional lens to it, how they can't ignore that important part of this. Yeah, that's so critical. And, you know, this conversation really hurts me. It makes me extremely sad to not only reflect on these 230 plus bills that are anti-LGBTQ, um, but also all of these bills that we're talking about right now around critical race theory. Um, and how that is also a part of the LGBTQ movement, because when we talk about Black and Brown folks, we are also queer and LGBTQ too. And so we're experiencing this just like double hit on saying, we don't want to talk about your history, your experiences. We need to bar that. Your identity doesn't matter to us. Your story doesn't matter. Um, and basically, we want you to be invisible. You know, and it's so tough and that we just have so much work to do um, when it comes to acknowledging our history and what we've done to so many communities in this country um, and ensuring that folks who are coming up, our youth are aware, they're knowledgeable on what happened and how that has this trickle effect on what we're experiencing. All these disparities and inequities we're talking today is not due to what is solely happening today it's due to what has happened over the last 400 years in this country. And if we don't acknowledge that, um, then we won't move forward. Um, someone made a really critical quote um, the other day that really stuck with me, how we should not um, confuse motion um, with progress. And I think we do that often. We see these things happening and you know, now we have amazing organizations like PIOW and we're saying, okay, we, you know, we have a voice and so forth. But then when we look at the systemic barriers that are trying to put us back, it's like, are we really making progress or are we just making motion and movement? Um, and so to make progress, it does require us to acknowledge our history, um, know our history, and figure out ways to really move forward uh, with it, especially when it comes to our educational institutions and making sure that we're equipped with the knowledge and the wisdom that we need to support all the communities um, that they do serve. Um, and one other piece that is a little bit out of um, these bills is also the Pell Grant. Um, and so that's more so affiliated with uh, my industry in higher ed and graduate school, right now we do have a Pell Grant for undergraduate education, but there is no Pell Grant for graduate um, school and advanced education. Um, and that's something that um, folks have been pushing for a while now. We definitely need to put more energy around it um, if we wanna give access to the highest levels of education. 
Right now, 36% of LGBTQ folks um, have federal loan debt compared to 23% of non-LGBT adults. Um, and just that alone, we see how that bars us from certain career opportunities. We always have to think about um, the money. Who's going to pay off my loans? Do I go get another degree? Um, what type of benefits does this company offer um, in terms of loan forgiveness and so forth? Um, and so acknowledging those things and those disparities, even when it comes to the finances of getting to these leadership um, positions that we talk about in the workforce, um, it's a lot of systemic barriers um, there too. And so we really need to push Pell Grant um, for advanced education. We really need to ensure that critical race theory and you know, I mean, honestly, I, I don't even like to call it critical race theory. We really need to ensure that we can talk about our history in our schools in general and it's not barred um, and making sure that LGBT folks can show up, you know, however they choose to show up and that we're not barred by um, a few electeds who uh, are concerned about their comfort. I'm so grateful that you brought this up. It's all interconnected and it's all part of a broader shift in trend that um, I often hear re relating to a rebound when you have rights, there's a, there's a rebound effect, right? Where they then like, they call it waves of feminism, right? There's a move in and then there's a move back out. But over mm -hmm. time, we know that this is just a matter of continuing the fight in air quotes, that fight looks differently. And I do think that what we're talking about today, yes, is the workplace. And I think that a lot of what organizations do actually can start to impact and lower these barriers, the employer. Like the capital E employer has such a remarkable role in the lives of their employees that this is truly an opportunity to do better. Um, but I think it starts, Derek, with that understanding of these laws, this, this, even the positioning around the word CRT, right? This kind of framing, the othering that's happening, the scapegoating that's happening. That's a political sphere, but it does have impact about your experience doesn't matter. Your story doesn't matter. I think that's the point at which every organization can start to say, do we as a business balance with affirming experiences and affirming narratives that yeah. your experience does matter, that we see you, that we, to Connor's point, see and Grace's point, we see the unique um, realities that you join our workforce with and are ready and equipped to, to address them. That's that's what this conversation is about. I also wish it's a conversation we could have for another three hours, but we've got only about seven minutes left. So I want to let everyone know we've got some great questions that have come in Q&A. Um, now that you're in this webinar, you will be on the PIOW email list. We were going to follow up with some resources to address some of the questions that we won't get to, because now I want to ask my panelists to please give us your final calls to action. If there's one thing, if there's a few things that organizations or individuals on this call should know or should do, and we're going to put out how to get in touch with each of your organizations on screen. Um, what would that be? What is your final call to action to folks today, again, about advocating on behalf of the future generations of LGBTQ plus professionals? Connor, as usual, I'm throwing you on the spot, my friend. Hit us. Awesome. Well, I have a few different ways that folks can help out. I'd say the easiest, simplest way you don't have any time on your hands is just to follow us on social media. I included the links earlier uh, on Instagram. We're at break time on other social medias, break time Boston. Um, it's very important because that's how you're really going to stay up to date, not only on what we're doing, but also on uh, all the educational content we put out about the challenges that LGBTQ plus young people experiencing housing insecurity face. And that's important for our own collective uh, education and also for our ability to share that with others. Um, and that's just one really easy way that you can support our movement to break the cycle of young adult homelessness. Number two is if you go on our website, um, you can you can contact us through our website. I can also drop uh, my contact information. If your company specifically is interested in working with us in any given way, we're really open to partnership. Um, so please reach out if you think that your company could get engaged, if this is something where um, you feel like your company would want to sponsor us in some way, your volunteers to get involved, um, let us know. Uh, we'd be really, really excited and happy to work with you. And then finally, um, I already mentioned, well, I already mentioned the advocacy piece, so I'll, I'll skip that one. But finally, if there's any way you can financially contribute to support our work, the work we do to support each and every single one of the young people um, we, we work with requires a lot of resources. Um, and we support, we appreciate every single person that can make this work possible. As I said before, um, not only is patience required to support 
folks who are transitioning into the workforce, but investment is required as well. And for break time to be able to invest, to create uh, and foster the future LGBTQ plus leaders of our workforce, we need support from our whole LGBTQ plus community. So if you or your company, anyone you know is interested in investing in our work, um, our donate link is on the website. And then also again, um, we're really accessible, easy to get in touch with. I can drop my contact info and there's a contact form on the website. So there's some quick and simple ways to get involved. And again, just really appreciate you all being here and I'm grateful for the time that you took today to, to talk with us. Thank you, Connor. And thank you for all the work you do. Grace, my love, final words for our audience and any way that you think they can take direct action. Well, absolutely. You know, all that Connor said for all three of our organizations, you know, you know, reach out to us, connect to our websites, you know, call us, email us and find out ways to that you can support our work and support uh, the whether it's around funding or sponsorship or volunteering or whatever that is. Um, and I think it's also important, you know, in a broader perspective to, you know, I, I would say pay attention you know that it, it's so easy to feel like we're overwhelmed. It's too much. Can't follow that. You know how do you keep up with it all? You know, and it. I think for for it, we all have parts of our identities that are that are stigmatized, and other parts of our identities that are more privileged. And just remember what we all need to step up in support of our not only ourselves but each other. And so pay attention to what's going on and see what you can do to make a difference. No one of us can do everything, but if you're if your little corner of the world is what you can do in your workplace or in your community or or reaching out to an organization, then then do that and 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 get others to do that because again, it's about community investment and moving all of us forward. Absolutely. My favorite Mary Oliver quote, Grace, is to pay attention. This is our endless and proper work. Thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you for all you do at Bagley. And Derek, of course, my love, final thoughts for the audience, as well as any direct action you'd like to encourage today. Yes. Thank you again so much for having us um, here today. I would say my first thing, as Grace just said, to um, is pay attention and to support and love on your family and friends. I think too often we overlook um, the proximity we have to young LGBTQ folks who are going through these experiences. They feel so alone. Um, and so if you know someone in your community, um, just reach out to them, know that they are, share with them that they're loved, that they have support, they have someone to speak with. And I think that's really important and we need more of that. Um, I'll say in terms of leadership binary, um, please join our movement. Um, we have over 500 individual donors um, who all believe that we must urgently increase access um, to leadership roles in the workforce for underrepresented communities. Um, that's exactly what we're doing. So if you want to get your company involved, and we would love for you to get involved individually, please reach out. I put my LinkedIn in the chat, also my email there. Um, also, if you want to connect us with your alma mater, if you feel like they need more diversity, which I can tell you most of these institutions do, um, we have members here at Leadership Brandery, currently 15 postgraduate institutions are our members. Um, they're actively committed to recruiting the talent that we have. And so we would love um, for you to do introductions to your alma mater too, to get them on board um, with our mission to increase um, diversity in their graduate programs. So thank you so much. Thank you each for being part of this conversation today. Again, I wish we had more time. Um, please stay on board with PIOW because our whole mission is to elevate voices like what you've heard today um, to make sure that we're constantly staying on top of these changing um, narratives as well as changing needs of this community. Um, so Grace, Connor, Derek, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I wanna do a final plug for each of these organizations, check them out, donate. And I wanna thank um, the sponsors who make PIOW and this event possible. Um, if you're an allied business hoping to also improve your employee experience to address some of the themes that you heard today, let us know. You can get in touch with us on our website, um, any of our, our social networks. And I want to do one more plug to the grant program. Help us give you the money that you need to grow your Massachusetts-based or New England-based small nonprofit affecting and, and, and working to help the LGBTQ plus community. If that's you or somebody you know, pass this info along. We got checks, the big checks waiting to be written um, to give you seed grants, uh, skill and operational development to do your thing and do it well, um, and visibility and support. So the deadline for that is May 31st. Um, again, my panelists, thank you. We are in awe of you and your work, and we're very grateful for it. Um, and so PIOW's info is here on the screen. This is not the last event you can experience from us this year. So now if this is your first event, we hope it is the first of many. Um, and if you've been with us before, welcome back. 
Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you for a rich conversation, both on air and in the chat. Um, and we do hope that everyone has a safe, safe spring ahead, my friends. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The work continues.